welcome everybody to this uh, Global Virus Network webinar. As always, a few words of introduction to the GVN, and then I will. It will be my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nath. So, as most of you are aware of, Global Virus Network is a network now of about 70 research centers worldwide and 11 affiliates created in 2011 by Bob Gallo and William Hall. And uh, this is really a network which is science driven, independent, international, and which activities are focused on research with various task force, on education and training with the GVN Academy, and on advocacy communication. And these webinars are an important uh, part of our uh, activities. Uh, so this is the context. So today, it's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Avindra Nath. Uh, Dr. Nath is the clinical director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at NIH. He's also chief of the section of infections of the nervous system and director of the Translational Center for Neurological Science. Dr. Nath has been educated in uh, India and then uh, at uh, Texas, uh, uh, at the University of Texas in Galveston. Uh, then he had a number of fellowships and uh, uh, increasingly important positions, the University of Manitoba, then Kentucky, then he joined John Hopkins, and finally from 2011, He's at NIH, and I mentioned his position. Dr. Naf is an excellent example of what a physician scientist, when excellent, uh, can achieve. He's focused on neuroimmunology, neurovirology. He has been uh, investigating the neurological consequences of many viruses, including Zika, Ebola, also endogenous retroviruses and also nowadays SARS-CoV-2. So he has received a lot of uh, important awards and recognitions. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome him and to listen to this uh, lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Nath. Uh, thank you for that very, very kind introduction. I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity to uh, present to you on the neurological complications of, of COVID. And um, uh, so I'll plan on talking for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes and then hope to engage you in a discussion. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna share my slides again. Okay, are you able to see my slides? Okay, yes. Okay, good. Um, so, let me see. okay, so I'm going to talk about the neurological complications of COVID, but I want to start with this uh, quote first. And, um, and this is by Sir William Osler when he was uh, the chair of internal medicine at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, in 1896, he gave the presidential address to the um, uh, American uh, Medical Association. And at that time, he said, humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. If he was alive today, he probably would have included climate change. Of uh, these by far the greatest and by the far most terrible is fever. And I think uh, what he was trying to communicate is that uh, more people die of infections than they do of all other uh, calamities uh, that humans face. And that really is true because if you look at the history of, of human evolution, there are these waves of infection that come and kill large numbers of people, and then few people remain. And, uh, and this is a, um, a picture not from that uh, long ago, it's at the time of the AIDS pandemic, and you can see that when you have a uh, pandemic of that uh, large in nature, it causes a lot of social unrest, not unlike what we're seeing today. And uh, this is a, on the right-hand side is a photograph of the uh, 
um, the uh, National Mall in Washington, DC. And you can see that this is the AIDS quilt there. So uh, every piece of fabric would represent an individual who had died of AIDS. So every year they put it out and eventually the quilt became so big that the mall could no longer hold it. Okay. Now you go ahead 40 years and now you have COVID and it's the same mall. This time what you have is you have the US flags. This is at the time of Biden's inauguration, about 400,000 people had died by that time. And each uh, flag represented an individual who had died of COVID in the United States. Well, it didn't take long before that number more than doubled. And uh, you have over a million people who have died now, right? And, um, and even today, there are about three to 400 people dying every day. Yeah? Um, so that is just huge numbers of people um, still dying with a lot of children now affected and hospitalized as well. So the pandemic is far from over. Uh, there are several uh, coronaviruses that infect humans, so about seven or eight of them. And, um, uh, but the interesting thing is that all of them cause uh, neurological complications. Um, and um, if you look at the uh, SARS-CoV-2, again, there are several different variants that have come out um, and one after another. And the neurological complications are quite similar with most of them, although their infectability has changed. So the more newer ones are more infectious. Um, and uh, the only difference being that what we understand of Omicron, it seems to be less virulent, although it is more infectious. Okay? But less virulent doesn't mean it's not uh, bad. It's still killing three to 400 people every day. So it's still pretty virulent. Okay, so what are the neurological complications? Um, so you can divide them into three main categories. I think an important thing to remember is that oftentimes when a pandemic occurs of this nature, people get focused on the primary uh, organ that is involved and uh, often they do not pay attention to what's happening to the brain. And uh, the reality is that ultimately all the socioeconomic consequences, long-term disability, is almost all from neurological complications. So I think understanding these things early on is absolutely critical uh, to have appropriate interventions. So acutely, um, uh, you know, there's no surprise that some patients are going to develop metabolic syndromes uh, just from the fact that multiple organs are involved, but there's some specific things that can happen. One is a direct invasion of the brain with the virus is extremely rare only in immune suppressed individuals. Uh, there are some individuals who will die suddenly, which we call Ondine's curse. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then there are a, a number of patients who develop strokes, um, which is also quite interesting. There are multiple reasons for that. And I'll discuss that in, in a bit. Then there are a whole host of inflammatory syndromes that occur in the subacute phase. And, uh, uh, and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy, these things are quite common uh, with um, almost all types of infection. But what is unique here is this multi-inflammatory syndrome that occurs largely in children, but also in adults. And then I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about long COVID. So what I want to convince you is that a lot of these complications you see are the common theme behind it is really vascular injury uh, by the virus. So if you look at the different types of strokes that occur, it's quite interesting that patients will develop cerebral infarcts, but what is interesting is that you can see infarcts on both sides of the brain. That is extremely unusual, okay? So at the same time, you can have multiple blood vessels that can get occluded, and not only to the brain, but also to other organ systems and deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, all at the same time, as the cerebral infarct that occurs in the brain. So if a patient comes with a syndrome suggestive of vascular occlusion of one organ system, you gotta look very extensively because they may have other occlusions as well. Some patients will develop these microhemorrhages. Um, we think that they're, at least in some of them, they're related to ECMO, use of ECMO. Uh, but there are some others that will develop 
spontaneous micro bleeds as well. Uh, but this um, external heart lung machine that is used in these patients is probably responsible for some of these uh, micro hemorrhages. Some patients can develop uh, thromboses of the venous system as well. So uh, that's another thing to, uh, to be quite cognizant of. Now, if you look at these neurological complications, um, one often thinks that, okay, the respiratory manifestations are gonna be first and then followed by neurological complications, but that's not really true. There are a number of these neurological complications that can actually be the presenting feature of the infection and the respiratory symptoms may then trail by a few days. And so, as you can see here, the cardiovascular manifestations, delirium, the psychiatric manifestations, a number of these things can occur before the onset of the respiratory symptoms. So I told you what about the stroke. So why are these patients developing all these vascular complications? So one possibility is they have a coagulopathy. And, uh, uh, and this study here uh, looked at antiphospholipid antibodies uh, from University of Michigan, and uh, they claimed that nearly half of their patients had antiphospholipid antibodies. And about 30% of them had greater than 40 units, which is extremely high titers. So some presence of antiphospholipid antibodies in a person who has any kind of infectious process is uh, quite normal. And they call, it's called an acute phase reactant, and it may not be of much significance. However, if the titers are very high, and what these researchers did was they took these antibodies and then put them in mice and showed that it was causing their coagulopathy, suggesting that yes, these antibodies are of pathogenic significance. So I think the presence of these antibodies here need to be taken seriously and treated appropriately. Uh, we looked at some brains of patients who had died of COVID and there are some micro hemorrhages here. As I can show you here, some congestion of blood vessels. Um, and, uh, and this study here shows that um, uh, individuals who are APOE4 positive have higher uh, um, possibility of uh, developing cerebral bleeds and uh, the total number of mi micro bleeds are also increased, okay? So APOE4 is a risk factor for these uh, uh, hemorrhagic complications. So we were able to do a high resolution MRI scans on these autopsy tissues. So let me tell you a little uh, background story on this. So in, early in the pandemic, nobody was doing autopsies uh, on these patients. Uh, certainly they were not taking out the brain. And the reason for that was that you have to cut through the skull and people either they didn't have the vacuum saws, they didn't have the PPE or they didn't have a negative pressure uh, autopsy room in order to do that because you produce a lot of bone dust and the bone dust has to be collected properly. Um, and um, so we um, uh, called around and sent emails to all the major centers around the country and uh, it was nearly impossible to get brain tissue. Uh, we finally managed to get some from the New York Medical Examiner's Office. They too said that, you know, when I, uh, that if a patient tested positive for COVID, they just put those uh, bodies in refrigerated trucks and they had over 200 bodies in refrigerated trucks at that time. And I, I talked to them, but what they didn't know is that they had already done autopsies on COVID patients without really knowing that they had COVID at the time because um, and the patients were, were dying at home or in subway, the whole number of people who just were found dead at home or in the subway in New York, and they ended up in the medical examiner's office. So they're all sudden deaths. Or otherwise, who were relatively healthy individuals, they weren't sick enough to uh, go to uh, the hospital to seek care. And uh, so we managed to get some brain tissues from them. And what we did was we put them through these uh, seven Tesla scanners, uh, pretty high resolution. And, and we also put them through an 11 Tesla scanner. So here is a, through a seven Tesla scanner. And we took micro sections all the way throughout this brain because during the early part of the pandemic, all the NIH was shut down, everybody was at home. And the only people who were doing COVID research were allowed to come in. Uh, 
So our MRI, research, uh, MRI researchers were more than happy to put some brains through their uh, scanner uh, just so that they had an opportunity to come back to work. Uh, but here, what we found is you can see, and this is the pond and this is the blood vessel here. It has three different types of pathologies and that's sing one single blood vessel. You see the wall of the blood vessel is thickened. Okay, so that's abnormal. You see in the middle, there's a small clot sitting there. It's a micro clot microthrombosis, and that same blood vessel cut in a different plane at the bottom, where you see this arrow, you can see that here there's a microhemorrhage. So you have three different pathologies in the same uh, 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 let me get a pointer here. Uh, okay, yeah. So you can see this uh, uh, micro hemorrhage over here, right? Okay. So um, uh, it turns out that um, if you look at um, it, uh, patients with um, uh, uh, and individuals who develop strokes, the other risk factor for them is actually inflammation. Okay. So this is an interesting study that looked at uh, D dimer levels. And what they calculated was the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And uh, what they found was that uh, this neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, as well as the D-dimer levels, will predict individuals who are going to develop stroke or die from the stroke. Okay. There's some individuals who will develop tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, and uh, others who develop uh, vestibular disorders, okay, which is vertigo. And uh, these are of acute onset, and we think they are most likely related to uh, blood vessel occlusion supplying the inner ear, okay, because they are acute onset, and they probably are thrombotic events. Okay, what about the subacute phase? So in the subacute phase, um, uh, you will see uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and acute necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy, which can be seen with almost a variety of different types of infections. Um, but it is important to remember is that the acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is largely a T-cell mediated process. You see these ring enhancing lesions in the brain here in the spinal cord. Uh, acute necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy is often cytokine mediated and it often starts in the thalamus. So the, you see the bilateral, the symmetrical lesions in the thalamus, and you can see this hemorrhage here in the thalamus. Then it'll spread to other parts of the brain. So the pathophysiology is important to remember because that's how you're going to treat these patients. Okay, they have uh, different modes of treatment for each one of them. In children, um, they uh, develop the syndrome called multi-system inflammatory syndrome with COVID uh, or MIS-C. And within the brain, they can present with, uh, uh, you know, an encephalopathy, dysarthria, dysphagia, or generalized weakness. If you look at the uh, MRI, you'll see this lesion in the splenium of the corpus callosum. And, uh, and you will see acute phase reactants in these uh, patients as well. So uh, signs of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And they will respond to treatment with uh, IVIG uh, dexamethasone. Um, you can also see various types of uh, cranial neuropathies in these patients, and you can see inflammation of the cranial nerves. So, uh, uh, and there's at least one group that claims uh, that they can find some virus in these uh, cranial nerves. Uh, but nonetheless, the uh, treatment for uh, all these individuals is immunotherapy. And um, at least in the literature, these cases have responded to use of IVIG. And not just the peripheral nerves, you can also get myositis in these patients. And you can see these inflammatory cells invading the, uh, the muscle. And what is also interesting is you can see expression of HLA antigens on the muscle fibers. Usually there should be no HLA antigens on them. Uh, and uh, they will also respond to use of uh, uh, IV corticosteroids. But often you have to give them high-dose corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now let's talk about uh, long COVID. So the term long COVID was coined by patients and because uh, they developed COVID and then they were not getting better. So they said, well, I'm suffering from long COVID. This is the term that seems to be most commonly used, but it is confusing because everybody, there's no good definition for it. Uh, and um, people mean different things by the term itself. But nonetheless, if you take all comers, uh, individuals who have persistent symptoms, what is clear is that um, if you have individuals with acute COVID and they have various types of symptoms here, they're divided by the number of symptoms that they have. What is, I think, common among all these studies is that most patients will get better by about three to five months. But if you don't get better by that much time, then likely your symptoms are going to persist for over a year or longer. Okay. So this is from uh, the UK. Uh, where they looked at about 80,000 patients. And this is from the Netherlands. And here they had another large number of patients. They divided their population into severe, mild, and moderate. And it's true that if you have more severe symptoms, chances are, um, greater chances are you're not going to get better. But there are also individuals who have pretty mild symptoms uh, initially, then they develop new symptoms and they don't get better. Okay. And also this uh, seems to occur more commonly in women than in men. And the age group is about 30 to 40 years of age. So I like to divide them into two categories, okay? One that had these uh, well, hospitalized patients, they had very severe symptoms and then they did not get better. And I think separating these individuals from the others is important because often they may have had end organ damage during the acute phase. Then you have these other individuals who have uh, relatively mild symptoms. They got better, but then after a few days, weeks, they then develop new symptoms and then they persist for a long period of time. So just as I said, you have these post-intensive care syndrome. That's what I like, would term it as. And then this I term long COVID. These are individuals who had relatively mild symptoms and then developed a variety of different types of symptoms. You can divide them into four buckets further. The top two can be collapsed a little bit closer and the bottom two collapsed a little bit closer. And the reason is the top two are mainly CNS symptoms and the bottom ones are mainly peripheral nervous system symptoms. So what these individuals are complaining of is exercise intolerance. Um, and, um, and it's an exertional type of fatigue so for example, um, I, I'll tell you a story of one cardiologist I talked to in, uh, in New York. And what she said is that, um, you know, she had, um, uh, she developed these new symptoms uh, after just a mild episode of COVID. And now, even if she took one flight of stairs, she couldn't even do telemedicine any longer. Okay, she was so exhausted. Um, and because she was a cardiologist, she had an extensive pulmonary and cardiac workup and they didn't really find anything wrong with her. Other individuals complain of brain fog. And so what they have is um, executive function is impaired. And, um, and I'll give you an example of uh, one person who um, worked for the US Congress and her job was at these very congressional meetings she would uh, maintain the minutes and she had to be able to multitask all the time in order to do it. And she didn't think there was anything wrong with her. She recovered from COVID, goes to work, and then she realizes she can't do her job any longer. She could not do all the multitasking that she was doing before. And she realized that she must have the so-called brain fog. Okay? Then we have a number of individuals who have various kinds of pain syndromes. Okay? And, um, uh, and um, uh, peripheral neuropathies with paresthesias is fairly common. Uh, and then some individuals develop uh, dysautonomia. This can be extremely debilitating. I know of one neurologist who uh, developed this syndrome and she said that she couldn't even sit up in bed. So she was lying down in bed in order to talk to me. Um, and, uh, and so she had to give up her practice and because she was so affected by the uh, dysautonomia. Uh, eventually, we treated her with IVIG. She took several courses, but she got, uh, got better. 
Also, some individuals will develop uh, a, a depression or psychosis for the very first time in their life. So I'll tell you a story of an NIH employee. He was um, in his 50s, no reason to get depressed. All of a sudden, after COVID, uh, he says he went and got himself admitted to the emergency room because he was afraid he was going to kill himself. Right? And so he got afraid of himself, he says. Uh, and uh, he was in the hospital for over a month. And then eventually he got treated and now he's back to work. So we brought in a number of patients here to NIH. And uh, now we had a somewhat biased population. We brought in only individuals who had neurological complications. And what we found was that 100% of them had cognitive dysfunction and this uh, fatigue. Right? And then uh, variable numbers of individuals had all these other uh, symptoms as well on top of that. Uh, this is a recent publication in which they showed that some individuals will develop restless leg syndrome. Uh, and, um, and you can see that uh, pre-COVID um, patients had some uh, restless leg syndrome, but if you see post-COVID, they are almost three times the number that have um, restless leg syndrome. Now that's important to recognize because this is thought to be in part due to iron deficiency. So there's an opportunity for intervention. Uh, but recognition of the syndrome is important. Okay, so why are these patients developing brain fog and all these other executive dysfunction? So there are some PET studies that I want to show, share with you and MRI studies. And this one is on subacute uh, patients. And what they found was that uh, there was decreased uh, fluorodeoxyglucose uptake in the brain and throughout the entire cortex here. Uh, sparing the, uh, uh, the deep uh, matter, uh, gray structures uh, within the brain. And, uh, and you can see this uh, decreased uptake here, suggesting that there is some diffuse cortical uh, dysfunction. Now, this is another study. Here they looked at more um, um, uh, focal abnormalities. And what they found was that uh, there are the... Um, uh, some temporal areas over here within the brain at the base of the brain uh, and the brain stem uh, where they found decreased uh, metabolic activity. And I think that is important uh, because I'm going to show you in subsequent uh, pathology that uh, the base of the brain and the brain stem are much more involved than other parts of the brain. Uh, this is a very interesting study from the UK you know, Biobank. And here, before COVID, they had been following a large population of individuals uh, with the serial MRI scans and cognitive uh, testing. So when COVID hit, they had an opportunity to see uh, uh, how many individuals from their cohort developed uh, um, had um, uh, COVID and then look at their MRI scans to see if there are any changes that may have occurred in that population. So they had a total population of about 400 individuals who had developed COVID and a similar number of controls who did not, okay? And when they looked at their MRI scans and then compared them by age, they found that the total intracranial volume was decreased in these individuals who had developed COVID. And if you were older, the worse it was, okay? They also looked at the left parahippocampal gyrus and they found the same thing over there too. That uh, in general, all the COVID patients had lower volume and the older you are, the worse it is. And uh, they also looked at this one neurocognitive testing and they found that that was also worse in individuals who had COVID. Okay. So the, the bottom line is that whatever you do, do not get old. Okay, so when you look at all these changes, the question is, where is the virus? I mean, initially we thought that, you know, you have this viral infection, you're developing these neurological complications. Surely this has to be driven by the virus, right? And, uh, and there are a lot of reasons to think so. I mean, uh, if you look at where is the virus, the virus is sitting in the nasal mucosa and there's tons of virus coming out of the nasal mucosa. And what separates the nasal mucosa from the brain is this very thin piece of bone, which is called the cribriform plate. And it's called cribriform because it has a lot of holes in it. 
And through those holes, you have nerves, blood vessels, all kinds of things passing through them. So, um, however, the virus doesn't infect the nerves. What it infects are these support cells, which are called the sustenticular cells. And, um, uh, and these cells get infected, there's swelling, and they can compromise the function of the neurons causing anosmia. But the virus never enters the olfactory nerve itself. And in fact, if you look at this EM picture over here, what you will see is there are all these viral particles here. Um, and uh, so there's huge amounts of virus in the nasal mucosa. And if you look at the, um, um, and the if you try to look for virus in the tissues itself, you find that most of the virus here is sitting in the nasal mucosa. Very rarely do you find it in the olfactory bulb, okay? And when you do find it, you find very small amounts of virus there. So we looked at our cases uh, and we did very extensive um, uh, amounts of, um, um, you know, immunostaining, PCR, all kinds of other techniques to look for the virus. And we weren't able to convince ourselves that we found virus in the autopsy tissues. There are others who have detected virus and, um, but when they find it, they find very, very small amounts of virus or they find it very rarely, okay? So this is another study uh, from our colleagues here at NIH and uh, they uh, found that, um, uh, uh, that uh, um, very small amounts of virus could be found uh, when they ground up these tissues, okay? So for example, the most virus they found was in respiratory tracts, but here they have some tissues that are greater than 31 days since the acute onset of the infection. Now these are all autopsy studies here. And you can see that uh, within the brain, they found very, very small amounts of virus, okay? So the significance of this is not entirely clear, okay? Uh, when we looked at the um, brain tissues here, we did a, uh, put this through an 11 Tesla scanner and you can see the incredible detailed anatomy of the brain stem here. And we immunostained it for fibrinogen uh, because uh, fibrinogen should never enter the brain. It's such a large protein it should always stay within the blood vessel itself. Instead, we found that around the blood vessel, there's loss of fibrinogen here. And the further away you go from the blood vessel, the less it gets. But there's huge amounts of fibrinogen leaking into the ponds, also into the olfactory bulb. You can see lots of fibrinogen here in the olfactory bulb. When you looked at the blood vessels closely, we found that there are a lot of platelets just sticking to the blood vessel, okay? So all these brown cells are activated platelets. Some blood vessels are totally occluded. So it's no surprise that these patients develop infarcts. And I also want to draw your attention to is that most of this pathology is in the hindbrain, although you do find it in all parts of the brain. Um, we then looked at the blood vessels more closely to try and see what kind of pathology they have. And uh, this is a control brain on top, and this is from a COVID patient. And what we found is that on the endothelial cells, there are these, this adhesion molecule expressed in very large amounts. So the adhesion molecule expressed in large amounts, what's going to adhere is the platelets. So it's no surprise that the platelets adhere over here. But uh, why is it being expressed? Um, we find that there's complement uh, stuck to it as well. And so you had complement one, four, and uh, we also found uh, IgG and IgM uh, on there as well. So we think that it's an antibody mediated process that is activating the classical cascade uh, leading to uh, expression of adhesion molecules, okay? So if that causes compromise of the endothelial cells um, and leakage of fibrinogen, then what you will get is, is macrophages that are gonna come in in order to clean up the mess. So there's no surprise that in perivascular regions, we find a lot of macrophages over here, okay? And if you look at it, there's a very good correlation between detection of macrophages and the amount of fibrinogen. 
Uh, we also find astrocytes in the perivascular space here, but we almost never find T cells, very, very few T cells. If this was a viral encephalitis, you would find a lot of T cells, but there are hardly any T cells in the brain. Okay, this is the best images we could find. And when you do find the T cells, they're in the perivascular regions, not in the parenchyma. Now, this is a very interesting study that just got published and it's in Med Archive. And these are case reports of only two individuals. But what is interesting is that they use this very interesting PET ligand and this PET ligand binds to activated microglia. Now, at the bottom are healthy controls. On the top are these two patients. If you look at the amount of binding in these two patients, it's like night and day. I mean, this lights up like a Christmas tree. And, uh, and there's just huge amounts of microglial cell activation throughout the brain of these patients with long COVID. Suggesting persistent glial cell activation throughout the brain. There are other studies to support this kind of uh, observation. You can, this is a study uh, from a group in Germany. And uh, what they looked at, they did single cell sequencing from cells in the spinal fluid and what they found is that in patients with the so-called neurocovid, they have this mono2, which is a very aggressive, de-differentiated form of monocyte that are extremely active. Okay, uh, and they found that the interferon responses were actually decreased in these individuals, uh, and the T cells were exhausted. So the combination here is pretty bad because you have exhausted T cells, and uh, uh, and interferon responses also decrease, but you have very active uh, macrophages. Okay, so I showed you that there was microglial cell activation. We find that there's a lot of pathology in the brainstem. Again, here on an 11 Tesla scanner, you can see the medulla, all these nuclei in the medulla, they could never see in any other kind of uh, MRI technique. And so we homed in into each of these nuclei. And the reason I was interested in that is at that time, because I told you a lot of the brains that we got for individuals who had, were found dead at home. So I said, if, if they died, there are two possibilities. Either it's a cardiac abnormality or a brainstem abnormality. So I wanted to look at the pre-Bodzinger complex because that is what controls the respiration. What I found was that there was a lot of microglial cell activation in the brainstem. And when I looked at the pre-Bodzinger complex, the neurons were actually atrophic. So you can see on this HNE staining here, this neuron is atrophic and, uh, and you can see microglia around them. So this phenomenon is called neuronophagia. So one possibility is that these individuals lost their respiratory drive, it can occur during sleep and, uh, and then they die during sleep and it's called Ondine's curse. Um, this is an interesting study uh, whereby, um, these individuals looked at um, um, amyloid uh, uh, beta peptide levels and APP levels in the CSF of individuals who had neurological syndromes from COVID. And what they found is the levels are decreased. Levels are decreased very similar to what you see in Alzheimer's patients uh, because that suggests that the amyloid is accumulating in the brain and not leaking into the CSF. And uh, they also found that neurofilament levels were increased in these patients, suggesting ongoing neural damage. So this is of concerning because people are worried that these individuals who are surviving of COVID, is it possible that we may end up accelerating Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease? Uh, this is an interesting study coming out of a macaque um, uh, model, whereby they developed respiratory infection, but when they looked at the brain, they found that they were activated microglia, but uh, these uh, neurons have accumulation of synuclein. So these are called Lewy bodies and they accumulated in these neurons. And that suggests that uh, they have Parkinson's-like pathology that is present there. Um, this is another study, an autopsy study. Um, now the sample size is very small. It's only five in each group, but nonetheless, um, just I want to draw your attention to this graph over here. And they looked at the cortex and the cerebellum. And, uh, uh, and they looked at old people and young individuals. And they find that it doesn't really matter. Uh, all of them have accumulation of phospho tau. Okay. Um, and uh, certainly, um, 
there's much more uh, in the uh, cerebellum compared to the cortex. Uh, but um, accumulation of phospho tau is again a feature of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so let's see if we can. Okay, so this is the summary of what I th we think what is happening is that you have these uh, antibodies that target the endothelial cells, there's damage occurring, you get macrophages that are coming in, there's leakage of all these cytokines as well over here, you get the plasma proteins coming in, some micro hemorrhages at the same time, these microglia get activated, and then they chew up these neurons leading to normal injury, called neuronophagia here. So I think that's the uh, our hypothesis as to how the cascade of events is causing a long COVID. Okay, so it would really help if we had good animal models. Unfortunately, people have developed a number of animal models for COVID, um, but um, generally they have been disappointing. Um, and they most have mild infections. And then the ferret and mink, they're pretty exotic animals but we don't have a lot of tools available to study them. So we really need a good animal model to study the effects on the brain. Um, what would we do, uh, I think, in monitoring these patients with long COVID because now all these cohorts are being established and the question is how to look for effects on the brain. So what we need to do is uh, we need good biomarkers and so here is a suggestion that we look at normal injury markers and they have a variety of different things. You want to look at different parts of the neuron, look at the axon, you want to look at the astrocyte, you want to look at the synaptic proteins, uh, you want to look at um, markers of uh, vascular injury. So you want to look at adhesion molecules, you want to look at uh, growth factors because there's repair occurring too, and you want to look for antibodies against uh, ACE2, which is against the endothelial cells. Uh, and you want to look at a whole host of immune activation markers, okay? Um, so the other question now comes is, should we be doing clinical trials in these patients before we understand the pathophysiology? And my bias is we need to study pathophysiology in the context of clinical trials, okay? Because we have millions of people affected and we can be waiting too much longer or years before we do clinical trials. So we need to start with clinical trials now and not wait. If you wanted to do immunotherapies, there are a whole variety of different ones that can be done. And you can select patient populations uh, to decide which one would be the best approach to take. Okay? So immune studies can be done easily as part of your inclusion criteria. Um, the challenges in these clinical trials is oftentimes the endpoints are all subjective endpoints and the natural history is not very well known quite yet. So I'd like to conclude by saying is that direct invasion of the brain by SARS-CoV-2 is rare and does not explain the neurological complications. Um, immune exhaustion is driven by activation of innate immunity and, uh, and immune exhaustion and antibody-mediated phenomena. Endothelial cell damage by immune complexes is the primary pathophysiological process in neurocovid, and neuroinflammation may accelerate protein aggregation. So I want to acknowledge a number of people here. Uh, these are the people who provided us the tissues uh, and other neuropathologists who helped us in interpretation of these findings. Um, uh, Serena and I and, uh, wrote the review in science and the uh, cartoon that I showed you we put together. And these are the people who did all the uh, neuropathology uh, in my lab. And this is our uh, clinical group that are doing the uh, the clinical studies on long COVID here. And this is the MRI group and Walter is our Institute Director who uh, made this all possible. So I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we can stop sharing the slides. Uh, yes. And then we can yeah. start the... Thank you so much, Dr. Nath. That was great and uh, well, I would say.
both fascinating and uh, also frightening, but uh, that's the reality and that's what we have to, uh, to face. Uh, okay, so we will start with, uh, so you, you have the possibility to, to read maybe the questions. We have both on the discussion, I guess. Uh, yeah, maybe you can see it. We will start on the discussion. Yes, question can, about Dr. Maria can, Salvato. Yeah, no problem. I can uh, see both the Q&A and the chat. Okay, and, okay. Um, so the first question is by uh, Maria Salvato and wondering if there are pathological features that resemble Zika. So Zika mainly caused a congenital Zika syndrome, which was the unborn fetus um, because it was infecting progenitor cells. And so we haven't seen that kind of congenital malformations in, in children born of, uh, of COVID, but there are some very early reports saying that there could be some congenital syndromes. So I think we need to uh, look at them carefully to see if there's a possibility of it. And certainly there's not that kind of devastation as we saw with Zika would, would have become apparent uh, very early in the pandemic. Uh, and then Guillain-Barre syndrome that occurred with Zika, that was a very prominent feature. That remains somewhat controversial. There are papers claiming, there are a lot of Guillain-Barre syndrome that have been reported with COVID. It's just that, that people argue that the incidence is not above background or not. So that becomes a bit of a uh, challenge at the moment. Okay, uh, is it possible uh, to mention some aspects of the pathophysiology of viral infection behind the neurological symptomatology? Um, Actually, you, uh, you have in part addressed this. I believe that this question yeah. came during your talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but no, but you, you can provide an answer, another answer, of course. Okay, so I think, uh, we discussed the pathophysiology, so I'll move to the next one. And mm -hmm. the next one is, have you stained for spike protein in the brain? And yes, we used about five different antibodies at that time. Anybody who told us you should use this one or that one, we did them all. The problem we found with some of these antibodies is that they're nonspecific. If you use appropriate controls, you find that there's a fair bit of nonspecific staining of other tissues. And the other thing is that with human brain tissues, there's a lot of corpora emulatia that will sometimes non-specific bind antibodies. The, some ones that are published in the literature, when we looked at those photomicrographs carefully, I think they're all corpora. So I'm not convinced that we've really seen true spike protein immunostaining in the brain as of yet. Okay, and Dr. Gallo asks, um, no one coming with your uh, points on clinical trial, no one can argue with your points on clinical trials from this perspective, it seems that the only strong path forward, all I can say is let's go. Uh, thank you so much for your endorsement uh, of our uh, philosophy, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Gallo. Appreciate uh, that very much. And then you have a, a question in the Q&A. Okay, yeah, Wait, Alfredo, that's a great talk. Uh, some studies show amelioration of symptoms, including CNS symptoms uh, using Paxlovid and would argue for a role of viral replication or some um, non-specific effects of the drug. What is your take? Uh, yes, uh, I would agree um, with Alfredo. I think uh, this would be very interesting to really see. The problem is that uh, measuring the viral reservoir has been a real challenge. You know? So it's quite possible you have small bits of virus stuck someplace and maybe the restricted viral replication taking place in the gut or, or lymph nodes or, or in the respiratory tract, uh, we don't really know. But if one could somehow uh, get at the viral reservoir, uh, I think uh, that would be very, very revealing. You know? But you're absolutely right. I think the possibility that there could be uh, some viral reservoir cannot be excluded. And I think one needs to consider that among all the other possibilities. Uh, one possibility might be to look at immune suppressed individuals who developed long COVID. Uh, the chances of finding a viral reservoir there much be maybe much better. Yeah. Maybe to follow up on this question, uh, Dr. Naf, and uh, I know it's uh, a fashionable topic, but uh, any ideas on the impact of uh, gut microbiome? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
so yes, gut microbiome is involved in everything. Um, so any immune mediated disorder is somehow is involved with the gut. I mean, the gut is very fascinating. I think getting at it is a problem um, because uh, you know uh, you can. There are just so many variables when you look at the gut microbiome that implicating it in any, in any particular disease is very difficult. And then there are geographic differences, there are dietary differences, and and so. Uh, but you know, as a potential hypothesis, it's very very attractive. I mean, there are lots of them. And all your lymphoid system is right, sitting right in the gut itself. And leaky gut can do all kinds of things. You know, you can just give an animal LPS, for example, and you get microglial cell activation in the brain. So it certainly has to be part of the equation. Yeah. And are you aware of that um, during all these clinical studies you have been referring to and uh, the prospective studies which are being organized, do they consider uh, collecting the uh, stools and analyzing oh, yeah. the... Yes, yes. Yes. So the number of people collecting stools, we are doing that too. Uh, okay. So we are bringing in a cohort of patients. There's a small cohort, but we'll be doing very extensive study on it. any biological material that can be collected in a live patient, we're going to collect them all. Sure. So, uh, and, you know, even if it is not intuitively obvious what we can use them for, we're going to collect them nonetheless. Uh, because going back for the samples is so hard that you might as well collect more and then instead of less, you know. Okay. Uh, I do not see other questions. I have another question, and I do appreciate the difference between the antibodies you have mentioned, antiphospholipids, and so and the anti-interferon antibodies, which have been described oh, okay. by the group of Casanova. So I do appreciate that these are not the same. But I mean, in their studies uh, with correlation between these autoantibodies and severity and so on, was there anything also connected to the uh, severity of uh, brain lesions or follow-up on long COVID? I, I don't know. Yeah, so... Uh, so there's a group at UCSF that showed presence of autoantibodies to brain antigens in uh, two or three cases with uh, psychotic symptoms. But if you look at those autoantibodies, they're staining huge amounts of these brain cells. So what I worry about is that, you know, you can get polyclonal B cell activation with almost any kind of infection. And so low titer autoantibodies are very common, you know. And so one has to be very careful before you implicate these things. Um, you really have to show that the antibodies are of pathophysiological significance and that they're present at high titers. Because if, if you just look at patients who have stroke or head trauma, and you, you'll find autoantibodies. And, mm -hmm. But we don't think that the autoantibodies are causing damage to the brain. And, um, and most often they're also to intracellular antigens. That's the other thing. Um, these autoantibodies to intracellular antigens most often are just uh, epiphenomena. They don't really do anything. So I think sorting out the autoantibody is, is not an easy task, and most people end up overcalling them. You know? Okay. Well, I guess we are coming at the end of this presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It was really a great lecture. Very, very very a lot of excellent information thank you for all those who have attended this webinar and uh, thank you again dr nath and uh, i wish everybody good uh, morning afternoon evening as always bye Thanks bye thank much. you I appreciate it bye bye take care